The following is a free-for-download audiobook available on krishnapath.org. The Science of Self-Realization Chapter 7 Exploring the Spiritual Frontier Srila Prabhupada Arrives in America Several years after Srila Prabhupada first arrived in America, a disciple discovered the diary he had kept during his passage from India on the steamship Jaldut. Inside was a poem, handwritten in Bengali, that Srila Prabhupada had written on board the ship just after it had arrived in Boston Harbor. The poem beautifully captures Srila Prabhupada's first impressions of Western civilization and reveals his heartfelt determination to change the consciousness of America. My dear Lord Krishna, you are so kind upon this useless soul, but I do not know why you have brought me here. Now you can do whatever you like with me. But I guess you have some business here, otherwise why would you bring me to this terrible place? Most of the population here is covered by the material modes of ignorance and passion, Absorbed in material life, they think themselves very happy and satisfied, and therefore they have no taste for the transcendental message of Vasudev. I do not know how they'll be able to understand it, but I know your causeless mercy can make anything, everything possible because you are the most expert mystic. How will they understand the mellows of devotional service? O oh Lord, I am simply praying for your mercy so that I may be able to convince them about your message. All living entities have become under the control of the illusory energy by your will, and therefore, if you like, by your will, they can also be released from the clutches of illusion. I wish that you may deliver them. Therefore, if you so desire their deliverance, then only will they be able to understand your message. The words of the Srimad Bhagavatam are your incarnation, and if a sober person repeatedly receives them with submissive oral reception, then he will be able to understand your message. It is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam 1, 2, 17 through 21, quote, Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, who is the Paramatma Supersoul in everyone's heart, and the benefactor of the truthful devotee, cleanses desire for material enjoyment from the heart of the devotee who relishes his message, messages, which are in themselves virtuous when properly heard and chanted. By regular hearing the Bhagavatam and rendering service unto the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart is practically destroyed, and loving service unto the glorious Lord who is praised with transcendental songs, is established as an irrevocable fact. At the time loving service is established in the heart, the modes of passion, rajas, and ignorance, tamas, and lust and desire, kama, disappear from the heart. Then the devotee is established in goodness, and he becomes happy. Thus established in the mode of goodness, the man rejuvenated by loving service to the Lord gains liberation from material association, mukti, and comes to know scientifically of the personality of Godhead. Thus the knots of the heart and all misgivings are cut to pieces. The chain of fruit of actions, karma, is terminated when one sees the self as master." End quote. He will become liberated from the influence of the modes of ignorance and passion, and thus all inauspicious things accumulated in the core of the heart will disappear. How will I make them understand this message of Krishna consciousness? I am very unfortunate, unqualified, and the most fallen. Therefore, I am seeking your benediction so that I can convince them, for I am powerless to do so on my own. Somehow or other, O Lord, you have brought me here to speak about you. Now, my Lord, it is up to you to make me a success or failure. 
as you like. O spiritual master of all the worlds, I can simply repeat your message. So, if you like, you can make my power of speaking suitable for their understanding. Only by your causeless mercy will my words become pure. I am sure that when this transcendental message penetrates their hearts, they will certainly feel gladdened and thus become liberated from all unhappy conditions of life. O oh Lord, I am just like a puppet in your hands. So, if you have brought me here to dance, then make me dance. Make me dance, O oh Lord. Make me dance as you like. I have no devotion, nor do I have any knowledge, but I have strong faith in the holy name of Krishna. I have been designated as Bhaktivedanta, and now, if you like, you can fulfill the real purport of Bhaktivedanta. Signed, The Most Unfortunate, Insignificant Beggar, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, on board the ship Jaladut, Commonwealth Pier, Boston, Massachusetts, USA, dated 18th of September, 1965. Build Your Nation on the Spiritual Platform Asked to speak at the University of Nairobi in September 1972, Srila Prabhupada addressed an overflow crowd of students and government officials at the campuses Taifa, Independence Hall. In his lecture, he advised citizens of the developing nation of Kenya, quote, Please develop spiritually, for spiritual development is sound development. Don't imitate the Americans and Europeans who are, like, are living like cats and dogs. The atomic bomb is already there, and as soon as the next war breaks out, all their skyscrapers and everything else will be finished. End quote. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for kindly coming here to participate in this meeting for spreading Krishna consciousness. The Krishna consciousness movement is trying to bring human society to the point where everyone's life can become successful. The subject today is the real meaning of human life. We are trying to instruct the entire world about this meaning. Human life is attained after many, many millions of years of species of life according to the Padma Purana. Life began with aquatics, and for we can understand from Vedic literature that at the beginning of creation the entire planet was merged in water. This material world is composed of five gross elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. Besides these, there are three subtle elements— mind, intelligence, and ego. Behind these curtains is the spirit soul, which is covered by these eight elements. This information is given in the Bhagavad Gita. Human beings are not the only living entities who have to have a spirit soul. We are all spirit souls. Beasts, birds, reptiles, insects, trees, plants, aquatics, and so on. The spirit soul is simply covered by different dresses, just as some of you are dressed in white clothes, some in green, some in red, etc. But we are not concerned with the dress. We are concerned with you as spirit soul. Thus it is said in the Bhagavad Gita 5.18, Vidya Vinaya Sampane Brahmani Havga Vihastini Suni Chai Vasupakicha Pandita Samadarshana Quote, The humble sage, by virtue of true knowledge, sees with equal vision a learned and gentle Brahmana, a cow, an elephant, a dog, and a dog eater. End quote. The sage does not make any distinction on the basis of color, intelligence, or species. He sees every living entity as a small particle of spirit soul. It is stated Keshagra Satabhagasya Saman Satamsa Sadsha Mika Jiva Sukshma Sarupoyam Quote, there are innumerable particles of spiritual atoms which are measured as one ten thousandth of the upper portion of a hair. End quote. 
Because we have no instrument to measure the dimensions of the spirit soul, the small particle of spirit soul is measured in this way. In other words, the soul is so small that it is smaller than an atom. That small particle is within you, within me, within the elephant, within gigantic animals, in all men, in the ant, in the tree, everywhere. However, scientific knowledge cannot estimate the dimensions of the soul, nor can a doctor locate the soul within the body. Consequently, material scientists conclude that there is no soul. But that is not a fact. There is a soul. The presence of the soul makes a difference between a living body and a dead body. As soon as the soul departs from the body, the body dies. It has no value. However great a scientist or philosopher one may be, he must admit that as soon as the soul departs from the body, the body dies. It then has no value and has to be thrown away. We should try to understand this. The soul is valuable, not the body. The fact that the soul is transmigrating is explained in Bhagavad Gita 2.22. Vasam sijimani yata vihaya nivani granati prarod prani yat tata sarirani vihaya jirani anyani samyati navani dehi. Quote, As a person puts on new garments, giving up old ones, similarly the soul accepts new material bodies, giving up old and useless ones. End quote. When a suit becomes old, we give it up and accept another suit. Similarly, the soul is changing dresses according to desire. Because the soul is part and parcel of God, it has godly qualities. God is the supreme will, the supreme power, the supreme independent one, and we, being part and parcel of him, have all these qualities in minute quantity. We have willing, thinking, feeling, and desiring in the Vedas, it is stated that God is the supreme living force among all living forces. Chaitanas Chaitananam. He is also supplying the necessities of all living entities. We living entities are innumerable. There is no limit to our number. God, however, is one. He is also living, but we, as we are, but we are a minute particles of that living force. For example, a particle of gold is the same in quality as the gold mine. If we chemically analyze the ingredients of a, in a small drop of water, we will find all the ingredients that are to be found in the vast ocean. In a similar way, we are one with God, being his part and parcel. This godly particle, the soul, or the living force, is transmigrating from aquatics to trees to pl and plants, and then from trees to plants to insect life, then to reptile life, and then to the bodies of birds and beasts. Darwin's theory of evolution is but a partial explanation of the transmigration of the soul. Darwin has simply taken information from Vedic literature, but he has no conception of the soul. The difference is that the soul is transmigrating from aquatic life to plants and trees, then to insect life, then to bird life, then animal life, then human life, then, and within human life he moves from uncivilized life to civilized life, etc. The civilized life of a human being represents the culmination of evolution. Here is a junction. From this point, we can again glide down into the cyclic process of evolution, or we can elevate ourselves to a godly life. The choice is up to us. This is indicated in the Bhagavad Gita. This human form of life is actual, actually means develop consciousness. Therefore, we should not waste our lives like cats, dogs, and hogs. That is the injunction. Although this body is perishable, like a cat's or dog's body, it is different in that one can attain the highest perfection in this life. We are part and parcel of God, but somehow or other we have fallen into this material existence, now we have to evolve in such a way that we can go back home, back to Godhead. That is the highest perfection. There is actually another world, a spiritual world, as stated in the Bhagavad Gita 8.20, Parastasmat Tubhava Nyo Vyakto Vyaktat Sanatana Yasa Sarveshu Bhuteshu Nashyastu Na Vinasyati 
Quote, Yet there is another nature which is eternal and is transcendental to this manifested and unmanifested matter. It is supreme and is never annihilated. When all this world is annihilated, that part remains as it is. End quote. In this material nature, everything is created. It stays for some time, produces some byproducts, dwindles, and finally vanishes. Our bodies are created at a certain moment by sexual intercourse. The semen of the father emulsifies and takes a pea form, and the living entity, or soul, takes shelter in that form, and because it takes shelter, it develops hands, legs, eyes, etc. This development is complete in the seventh month, and in the ninth month, the human being comes out of the womb. It is because the soul is present that the child develops. If the soul were not, is not present, there is no development, and the child was born dead. We can take this dead body and preserve it in chemicals, but it will not develop. Development means change of body. All of us have had baby bodies, but these bodies are no longer existing. The body of a baby develops into the body of a child, and that body develops into the body of a boy, and that body develops into a youth's body, which eventually turns into an old man's body. Finally, the body completely vanishes. The whole cosmic manifestation, the gigantic form of this material world, is also working according to this same process. It is created at a certain point, it develops, it is maintained, and at a certain stage it is dissolved. That is the nature of the material world. It is manifest at a certain interval, and again it vanishes. Bhutva bhutva pradyate. The word bhava means, quote, nature. There is another nature which never dissolves which is eternal. As jivas, spirit souls, we are also eternal. This is verified in Bhagavad Gita 2.20. Najayate mrite kaba katechin nayam bhutva bhavita banabayo ajon tya sashrito yam purano nahanyate hanimani sarede. Quote, for the soul, there is neither birth nor death, nor having once been, does he ever cease to be. He is unborn, eternal, ever existing, undying, and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain, end quote. Just as God has no birth or death, we spirit souls have neither birth nor death, but because we think, quote, I am this body, we consider that we are born and that we die. Such thinking is called maya, illusion, and as soon as we get out of this illusion of identifying the soul with the body, we attain this stage called Brahmabhuta. When one realizes Aham Brahmasmi, quote, I am not this body, I am spirit soul, part and parcel of the Supreme Brahman, end quote. He attains what is called Brahman realization. As soon as Brahman realization is attained, one becomes happy. Is this not a fact? If you understand clearly that you have no birth or, and death, that you are eternal, will you not become happy? Yes, certainly. Thus, when one is Brahman realized, full spiritually realized, he has no more to do with hankering and la or lamentation. The whole world is simply hankering and lamenting. You African people are now hankering to be like Europeans and Americans, and the Europeans have lost their empire and now they're lamenting. So in this way, one party is hankering and another is lamenting. Similarly, this material life is simply a combination of hankering and lamenting. We are hankering for those things which we do not possess, and we are lamenting for those things which we have lost. That is our material business. If we realize, however, that we are part and parcel of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Para Brahman, and that we are Brahman, then we will transcend this hankering and lamenting. The so-called universal brotherhood or unity that the United Nations is trying to achieve is possible only when you come to the spiritual platform or Brahman realization. Brahman realization is the aim of human life. One should not work like cats, dogs, and hogs. A hog is always very busy day and night to try to, trying to find stool, and when he finds it, he eats it and becomes sexually agitated and has sex without discrimination. A hog will have sex with its mother or sister or anyone else, and this is a hog's life. 
However, the scriptures indicate that the human form of life is not meant for working hard for sense gratification like cats, dogs, and hogs. It is meant for realizing, quote, I do not belong to this material world. I am spirit soul and am eternal, but somehow or other I have fallen into this conditional life of birth, old age, disease, and death, end quote. This human form of life is meant for making a solution to these four material miseries, birth, death, old age, and disease. That is the aim of human life. Just try to understand that, that this human life is not meant for working very hard like hogs and then having some sense gratification and then all of a sudden dying. People who do not believe in the soul are in an un most unfortunate condition. They do not know where they came from nor where they are going. Knowledge of the soul is the most important knowledge, but it is not discussed in any university. But what is the constitution of this body? What is the distinction between a dead body and a living body? Why is the body living, and what is the condition of the body, and what is its value? No one is presently studying these questions, but by this Krishna consciousness movement, we are trying to educate people so that they can understand that they are not these bodies, but our spirit souls. The business of human life is different from the business of cats and dogs. That is our message. As far as the soul is concerned, the evolutionary process is going on, and we are struggling for existence, struggling to come to the point of eternal life. That eternal life is possible if you try your best in this human form of life, in your next life, you get a spiritual body. Your spiritual body is already within you, and it will develop as soon as you become free from the contamination of this material existence. That is the aim of human life. People do not know what actual self-interest is. It is to realize oneself, to realize, quote, I am part and parcel of God, and I have to return to the kingdom of God to join with God, end quote. Just as we have a social life here, God has a social life in the spiritual kingdom. You can join him there. It is not that after this body is finished, you become void. No, that is a wrong conception. In the Bhagavad Gita 2.12, Krishna told Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurcheta, Na tveva ham jatu na sam na tvam neme janadipa, Quote, Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. End quote. The process for attaining eternal life is very easy, and at the same time very difficult. It is difficult because people in the beginning do not believe in the existence of transmigration of the soul. However, if we simply take knowledge from the authorities, the process becomes very simple. Our process of Krishna consciousness is to take knowledge from Krishna, the most perfect being, and not from an ordinary human being, conditioned by the laws of material nature. Knowledge taken from a conditioned being is sure to be defective. What are the defects of the conditioned soul? He is sure to make mistakes, sure to be illusioned, sure to cheat others, and sure to have imperfect senses. We cannot attain knowledge perfectly because we want to cheat others and our senses are imperfect. Although our senses are imperfect, we are very proud of our eyes and we want to see everything. Therefore, someone says, quote, can you show me God, end quote. Actually, the answer is yes. Why can't you see God at every moment? Krishna says, Raso, Ham Apsu Konteya, quote, I am the taste of water, end quote. Everyone drinks water, and the taste is there, so if we think of this taste as God, we begin the process of God realization. Krishna also says, Prabhamsi Sasha Shuriyo, quote, I am the sunshine, and I am the moonshine, end quote. We all see the sunshine and moonshine every day, and if we think of how it is that the sun and moon are emanating light, we will ultimately reach God. There are so many similar instances. If you want to be God conscious and realize God yourself, it is not very difficult. You simply have to follow the prescribed methods. In, as stated in Bhagavad Gita 1855, Tato mam tatvato gyantma, 
we must simply try to understand God in truth and try to understand his appearance, disappearance, and functions. When we understand him in truth, we immediately enter into the kingdom of God. After quitting this body, a person who understands God or Krishna does not come back again to accept a mater- another material body. Krishna says, Mameti, quote, he comes unto me, end quote. That is our aim. Therefore, we should not waste our time living like cats and dogs. We should live comfortably, but at the same time, we should be Krishna conscious or God conscious. That will help us become happy. Without understanding God and without becoming God conscious, there is no possibility of peace and happiness. The way of peace and happiness is outlined in the Bhagavad Gita. If you really want to understand God, he is very easy to understand. God is the proprietor of everything. Unfortunately, we are thinking, quote, I am the proprietor, end quote. In your country, for instance, the British have sometimes claimed to be proprietors, and now you are claiming to be the proprietors. So one who knows what will happen, so who knows what will happen in the future? Actually, no one knows who the real proprietor is. The land is there, and it is the property of God, but we are simply thinking, quote, I am the proprietor. I own this, and I own that, end quote. Actually, America existed before the Europeans came, but now the Americans are thinking, quote, we are the proprietors, end quote. Similarly, before them, the Red Indians were thinking, quote, we are the proprietors, end quote. The fact is that no man is an actual proprietor. The proprietor is God. Quote, Everything animate or inanimate that was within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. One should therefore accept only those things necessary for himself, which are set aside as his quota, and one should not accept other things, knowing well to whom they belong. End quote. Ishopanishad Mantra 1. This realization is wanting. Krishna claims proprietorship over all forms, including American forms, African forms, cat forms, dog forms, tree forms, etc. For in actuality, he is the proprietor and the supreme father. If we simply realize this, we attain God realization. Actually, if we realize God as prescribed in the authorized books and Vedic literatures, we will find that there is will no longer be quarrels between this party and that party. Everything will be peaceful. Everyone has the right to use God's property, just as soon as just as a son has a right to live at the cost of his father. It is stated in the scriptures that even a small animal in the home must be given some food. That is spiritual communism. No one should remain hungry, not even a serpent. We are always afraid of serpents, but if we find a serpent to be living in our house, it is our duty to see that the serpent is also fed. This is the conception of God consciousness or Krishna consciousness. Sarma sarveshu bhuteshu. One who is transcendentally situated is equally disposed to every living entity. Thus, the Bhagavad Gita points out that when one sees everyone equally as part and parcel of the Supreme Lord, one actually begins his devotional life. This Krishna consciousness movement is trying, in an authoritative way, to make everyone understand what he is and what the aim of life is. This process of purification of the heart is very easily accomplished. One simply has to chant this Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. It can actually be seen that in this movement there are boys and girls from different countries and different religions, but no one is concerned with any particular section or country or religious body. We are simply concerned about knowing ourselves and our relationship with God. God is the supreme proprietor, and we are all his sons or servitors. Therefore, let us engage ourselves in the service of the Lord, as recommended in the Bhagavad Gita. As soon as we understand that God is the proprietor of everything, then all the troubles of the world will immediately be solved. This may take some time. It is not expected that everyone will understand this high philosophy, 
But if the intelligent people in every country try to understand it, that will be sufficient. In the Bhagavad Gita 3.21, it is stated, Yad yad acharati sretas tatad eva tarojana, yat sayat paramam kurute lokas tadanavartate. Quote, whatever action a great man performs, common men follow in his footsteps, and whatever standards he sets by exemplary acts, all the world pursues. End quote. Therefore, we invite the most intelligent men in the world to understand this Krishna consciousness philosophy and try to distribute it all over the world. We have now come to these African countries, and I invite all intelligent Africans to come and understand this philosophy and distribute it. You are trying to develop yourself, so please develop spiritually, for spiritual development is sound development. Don't imitate the Americans and Europeans, who are like living like cats and dogs. Such civilizations built on the consciousness of sense gratification cannot stand. The atomic bomb is already there, and as soon as the next war breaks out, all their skyscrapers and everything else will be finished. Try to understand this from the real viewpoint of human life, the spiritual viewpoint. This is what this Krishna consciousness movement is about. We therefore request you to try to understand this philosophy. Thank you very much. Saintly Compassion Every religion has its own saints, but all saints share one transcendent spiritual quality, compassion. Srila Prabhupada explains. Today I shall speak to you about the glorification of the holy name of God. This was discussed between Maharaj Prakit and Shukadeva Goswami in connection with a Brahmana who was very fallen and addicted to all kinds of sinful activities but was saved simply by chanting the holy name. This is found in the sixth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. The universal planetary systems are very nicely explained in the fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Within the universe, there are some planets which are hellish. Actually, not only the Bhagavatam, but all religious scriptures contain descriptions of hell and heaven. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, you can, also, you can find out where those hellish planets are and how distant they are from this planet, and it's just as you can obtain information from modern astronomy. Astronomers have calculated how far the moon is from here and what the distance is between this planet and the sun. Similarly, the Bhagavatam contains descriptions of the hellish planets. We have experience of different atmospheric conditions even on this planet. In the western countries near the North Pole, the climate is different than in India, which is near the equator. Just as there are differences in atmospheres and li living conditions on this planet, similarly there are many planets that which have different atmospheres and conditions of life. After hearing a description of the hellish planets from Shukadev Goswami, Prikit Maharaj said, Adhunena Mahabhagha Yaitanava Narakanara Nanogra Yatanan Neyat Tanme Vyaktya Tum Arasi. Sir, I have heard from you about the hellish planets. People who are very sinful are sent to those planets. Srimad Bhagavatam 616. Prikit Maharaj is a Vaishnav devotee, and a Vaishnava always feels compassion for others' distress. He is very afflicted by the miseries of others. When Lord Jesus Christ presented himself, for instance, he was greatly afflicted by the miserable conditions of the people. Regardless of which country or sect they belong to, all Vaishnavas or devotees, any people who are God-conscious or Krishna-conscious, are thus compassionate. Therefore, to blaspheme a Vaishnava or preacher of God's glories is a great offense. Krishna, God, is never tolerant of offenses committed at the lotus feet of a Vaishnava. Kripambudi, a Vaishnava is an ocean of mercy. Vanchakalpataru. Everyone has desires, but a Vaishnava can fulfill all desires. Kalpataru means, quote, desire tree. There is a tree in the spiritual world which is called a desire tree. In this material world, 
you get a particular type of fruit from a particular type of tree. But in Krishna Loka, as well as in all the Vaikuntha planets, all the trees are spiritual and will fulfill all your desires. That is described in the Brahma Samhita. Chintan mani prakara shadmashu kalpa riksha. A Vaishnava is addressed as Mahabhagava, which means, quote, fortunate, end quote. One who becomes a Vaishnava and is Krishna conscious is understood to be greatly fortunate. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has explained that all that the living entities are rotating in different species of life in different planetary systems all over the universe. A living entity can go anywhere, to hell or heaven, and as he likes and as he prepares himself. There are many heavenly planets, many hellish species of life. The living entity is rotating, wandering through these species and creating bodies according to his mentality in the present life. As you sow, so shall you reap. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that out of all these num- numberless living entities who are traveling in the material world, one is fortunate, not everyone. If everyone were fortunate, they would have all taken to Krishna consciousness. It is being distributed freely everywhere. But why are people not taking it? Because they are unfortunate. Therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that the, only those who are fortunate take to this Krishna consciousness, and they get a hopeful life, pleasant life, blissful life, a life of knowledge. It is the duty of a Vaishnava to go door to door to make the unfortunate people fortunate. A Vaishnava thinks, quote, how can these people be delivered from their hellish life, end quote. That was Maharaj Prickett's inquiry, quote, sir, End quote, he said, quote, You have described that on account of one's sinful activities, one is put into a hellish condition of life or in a hellish planetary system. Now, what are the counter methods by which such persons can be saved? End quote. This is the question. When a Vaishnava comes, when God himself comes, or when God's son or his very confidential devotees come, Their only mission is to save the sinful man who are suffering. They have knowledge of how to do this. When Prahlad Maharaj met Nashingadev, he said, Quote, My dear Lord, End quote. Prahlad Maharaj says, quote, I am not very anxious for my own deliverance. End quote. Srimad Bhagavatam 7, 9, 43. My body philosophers are very careful that their personal salvation is not interrupted. They think, quote, if I go to preach in association with others, I may fall down and my realization may, will be finished. End quote. Therefore, they do not come. Only the Vaishnavas come at the risk of fall down, but they do not fall down. They may even go to hell to deliver the conditioned souls. This is Prahlad Maharaj's mission. He says, Naivo Duje, quote, I am not very anxious about living in this material world, end quote. Prahlad Maharaj says further, quote, I have no anxiety for myself, but somehow or other, because somehow or other I've been trained to always be Krishna conscious, end quote. Because he is Krishna conscious, he is confident that in his next life he is going to Krishna. It is stated in the Bhagavad Gita that if one executes the Krishna conscious regulative principles carefully, it is certain that he will reach the supreme destination in his next life. Prahlad Maharaj continues, quote, There is only one source of anxiety for me, end quote. Just see, although he had no anxiety for himself, he still had anxiety. He says, So chetato vimukha chetasa, quote, I am anxious for those persons who are not Krishna conscious. That is my anxiety. For myself, I have no anxiety. But I am thinking of those who are not Krishna conscious, end quote. Why aren't they Krishna conscious? These rascals have created a humbug civilization for temporary happiness. Maya Sukaya. Actually, this is a fact. 
We have a humbug civilization. So many cars are being manufactured every year, and for that purpose, so many roads have to be excavated and prepared. This creates problem after problem. Therefore, it is maya sukhaya, illusory happiness. And yet, we are trying to be happy in this way. We are trying to manufacture some way to be happy, but this only creates other problems. In your country, you have the greatest number of cars, but that does not solve any problems. You have manufactured cars to help solve the problems of life, but I have experienced that this also creates more problems. When my disciple Dayananda wanted to take me to a doctor in Los Angeles, I had to take the trouble to travel 30 miles before I could even consult the doctor. Once you create cars, then you must travel 30 or 40 miles to meet your friends. You can fly from New York to Boston in one hour, but it takes even longer than that just to get to the airport. This situation is called Maya Sakaya. Maya means, quote, false, end quote, illusory. We are trying to create some comfort- very comfortable situation, but we have created another uncomfortable situation. This is the way of the material world. If we are not satisfied by the natural comforts offered by God and nature, and we want to create artificial comforts, then we have to create some discomfort also. Most people do not know that. They think that they are creating a very comfortable situation, but actually they're traveling 50 miles to go to the office to learn and earn a livelihood and 50 miles to come back. Because of such conditions, Prahlad Maharaj says that these vimudhans, these materialistic persons, these rascals, have created an unnecessary burden on themselves simply for temporary happiness. Vimudhan, maya sukhayam bharam udvahato. Therefore, in Vedic civilization, it is recommended that one free himself from material life, take sannyas, the renounced order of life, and prosecute spiritual life with absolutely no anxiety. If one can execute Krishna consciousness in family life, that is very good. Bhaktivinoda Thakur was a family man, a magistrate, and still he executed devotional service so nicely. Duva Maharaj and Prahlad Maharaj were grahastas, householders, but they trained themselves in such a way that even as householders, they were faced with no interruption in their service. Therefore, Prahlad Maharaj says, quote, I have learned the art of always remaining in Krishna consciousness, end quote. What is that art? Tadvirya jnana mahamrita magnachita, simply glorifying the victorious activities and pastimes of the Lord. Virya means, quote, very heroic, end quote. Krishna's activities are heroic. You can read about them in Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Krishna's name, his fame, his activities, his associates, and all other things related to him are heroic. Prahlad Maharaj says in this connection, quote, I am certain that wherever I go, I can glorify your heroic activities and be safe. There is no question of my falling down, but I am simply anxious for these people who have created a type of civilization in which they are always busy working hard. I'm thinking of them. End quote. Prahlad further says, Prayena Deva Munaya Swamukta Kama Monam Charanti Vignani Vijane na parata nishta, naitan vihaya kripanam vimumukshayko, nanyam etatwad asya sharanam brahmatan upasye. Quote, My dear Lord, there are many saintly persons and sages who are inter- very interested in their own liberation. End quote. Srimad Bhagavatam 7 944. Munaya means, quote, saintly persons, end quote, or, quote, philosophers, end quote. Prayana Deva Munaya Svabe Mukti Kama. They are very interested in their own liberation. They try to live in solitary places, like the Himalayan mountains. They do not talk to anyone, and they are always afraid of mixing with ordinary people in the city and becoming disturbed or maybe even falling down. They think, quote, 
Better let me save myself, end quote. Prahlad Maharaj regrets that these great saintly persons do not come to the city, where people have manufactured a civilization of very hard work all day and night. Such saints are not very compassionate. He says, quote, I am anxious for these fallen people who are unnecessarily working so hard simply for sense gratification, end quote. Even if there were some point in working that hard, such people do not know what it is. All they know is sex. Either they go to a naked dance or to a naked club or to this or that. Prahlad Maharaj says, Naitan vihaya kripanam vimumuksha eka. Quote, My Lord, I do not need salvation alone. Unless I take all these fools with me, I shall not go. End quote. He refuses to go to the kingdom of God without taking all these fallen souls with him. This is a Vaishnav. Nanyam tad asyad sharanam brahmato nipusye. Quote, I simply want to teach them how to surrender unto you. That's all. That is my goal. End quote. A Vaishnava knows that as soon as one surrenders, one's path is clear. Quote, somehow or other, let them bow down before Krishna. End quote. This is a simple method. All you have to do is bow down before Krishna with faith and say, quote, My Lord Krishna, I was forgetful of you for so long, for so many lives. Now I have come to consciousness. Please accept me. End quote. That's all. If one simply learns this technique and sincerely surrenders himself to the Lord, his path is immediately open. These are the philosophical thoughts of a Vaishnava. A Vaishnava is always thinking about how the fallen conditioned souls can be delivered. He's always involved in making plans in that way, just like the Goswamis. What was the business of the six Goswamis in Vrindavan, Lord Chaitanya's direct disciples? That is stated by Srinivas Acharya. Nana Shastri Vichara Naika Nipino Siddharma Samshtapako Loka Nam Hitakari No Tibuvene Manyo Shamba Sharanya Karo Radha Krishna Padara Vinda Bhajana Nandena Mataliko Vande Rupa Sanatana Raguigo Shijiva Gopalako Quote, the six Goswamis, namely, Sri Sanatan Goswami, Sri Rupa Goswami, Sri Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, Sri Raghunath Das Goswami, Sri Jiva Goswami, Sri Gopal Bhatta Goswami, are very expert in scrutinizingly studying the revealed scriptures with the aim of establishing eternal religious principles for the benefit of all human beings. They are always absorbed in the mood of the gopis and are engaged in the transcendental loving service of Radha and Krishna, end quote. Sad Goswami Astika too. With similar Vaishnava compassion, Prahlad Maharaj says to Shukadev Goswami, quote, You have described different types of hellish conditions of life. Now, please tell me those, how those who are suffering can be delivered. Kindly explain this to me. Adhune na Mahabhagaha, Yaitava Narakan Nara, Nanogra Yatana Nenyat, Tane Vyakyat Tum Adhesi. Nara means human beings, those who are fallen. Narakan Nara, Nanogra Yatran, Nanayat Tanme, quote, How can they be delivered from the fierce miseries and horrible pains? End quote. That is a Vaishnava heart. Prahlad Maharaj says, quote, Somehow or other, they have fallen down to this hellish life, but that does not mean that they should remain in that condition. There must be some means by which they can be delivered. So kindly explain that. Shukadeva Goswami replied, Nachat eva pachitim yetam harsa kitasya kuryan Mana ukta panibi, durvam savai praita narakan apaiti, nakirtita me babatas tigma yatana. 
Quote, Yes, I already explained or described the different conditions, types of hellish conditions and very severe painful life, but one has to counteract it. End quote. Srimad Bhagavatam 617. How can this be done? Sinful activities are committed in various ways. We can commit sinful activity, thus, or thus make a plan, thinking, quote, I shall kill that man, end quote. Either way, it is sinful. When the mind is thinking, feeling, and willing, then there is action. The other day, I was reading a book that if someone's dog barks at you when you are passing on the road, then that is an offense on the part of the dog owner, according to the law. No one should have to be scared by dogs barking, so one should take care of his dog. I read this. It is a law in your country. The dog is simply barking, but it is sinful. The dog is not responsible because it is an animal, but because the owner of the animal has made the dog his best friend, he is responsible by law. If an outside dog enters your house, it may not be killed, but the owners of the dog may be prosecuted. Just as the barking of a dog is unlawful, so when you speak something offensive to others, that is also sinful. That is just like barking. Therefore, sinful activities are committed in so many ways. Whether we think of sinful activities, or we speak something sinful, or we actually commit a sinful activity, they are all considered sinful activities. Duram savai preta narakan epaiti. One has to suffer punishment for each for such sinful activities. People do not believe in an next life because they want to avoid this botheration, but we cannot avoid it. We must act according to the law, or we will be punished. Similarly, I cannot avoid God's law. That is not possible. I can cheat others, commit theft, and hide myself, thereby saving myself from the punishment of the state law, but I cannot save myself from the superior law, the law of nature. It is very difficult. There are so many witnesses. The daylight is a witness, the moonlight is a witness, and Krishna is the supreme witness. You cannot say, quote, I am committing this sin, but no one can see me, end quote. Krishna is the supreme witness sitting within your heart. He notes down what you are thinking and what you are doing. He also gives facility. If you want to do something to satisfy your senses, Krishna gives the facility for that action. That is stated in the Bhagavad Gita. Sarvesya charham ridi sanavisto. Quote, I am sitting in everyone's heart. End quote. Mata smiti jnanam apalanam cha. Quote, from me come remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. End quote. In this way, Krishna gives us a chance. If you want Krishna, he, then he will give you a chance to have him. And if you don't want Krishna, then he will give you a chance to forget him. If you want to enjoy life forgetting Krishna, forgetting God, then Krishna will give you all facility that you can forget. And if you want to enjoy life with Krishna consciousness, then Krishna will give you the chance to make progress in Krishna consciousness. That is up to you. If you think that you can be happy without Krishna consciousness, Krishna does not object to that. Yate chasi tatakru. After advising Arjuna, he simply said, quote, Now I have explained everything to you. Whatever you desire, you may be do. End quote. Arjuna replied immediately, Karasye tachanam tava. Quote, now I shall execute your order. End quote. That is Krishna consciousness. God does not interfere with your little independence. If you want to act according to the order of God, then God will help you. Even if you sometimes fall down, if you become sincere, quote, from this time on, I shall remain Krishna conscious and execute his orders, end quote, then Krishna will help you. In all respects, even if you fall down, he will excuse you and give you more intelligence. This intelligence will say, quote, don't do this. Now go on with your duty, end quote. But if you want to forget Krishna, if you want to become happy without Krishna, he will give you so many chances that you will forget Krishna, life after life. Prickett Mara says here, quote, It is not that if I say there is no God, there will be no God, or that I will not be responsible for what I do, end quote. That is the atheistic theory. Atheists do not want God because they are always sinful. If they thought that there were God, then they would be forced to shudder at the thought of punishment. Therefore, they deny the existence of God. That is their process. 
They think that if they do not accept God, then there is no punishment and that they can do whatever they like. When rabbits are being attacked by bigger animals, they close their eyes and think, quote, I am not going to be killed, end quote, but they are killed anyway. Similarly, we may deny the existence of God and the law of God, but still God and his law are there. In the high court, you may say, quote, I don't care for the law of the government, end quote. But you will be forced to accept the government law. If you deny the state law, then you'll be put into prison and be caused to suffer. Similarly, you may foolishly decry the existence of God. There is no God, or, quote, I am God, end quote. But, nevertheless, you are responsible for all your actions, both good or bad. There are two kinds of activities, good and bad. You, if you act nicely and perform pious activities, then you get good fortune. And if you act sinfully, then you have to suffer. Therefore, Shukadeva Goswami says, Tasmat Puraiv Vash Viha Papa Nikritao Yateta Mityor Avi Padyatatmana Doshasya Drishta Gu Lagavam Yata Bishak Chiti Kseta Dojam Nidanavit. Srimad Bhagavatam 618. There are different kinds of atonement. If you commit some sin and counteract it by something else, that is atonement. There are examples of this in the Christian Bible. Shukadev Goswami says, quote, You should know that you are responsible, and according to the gravity of sinful life, you should accept some type of atonement as described in the Shastras, or the scriptures, end quote. Actually, just as one when one is diseased, he must go to a doctor and pay doctor bills as a form of atonement. According to the Vedic way of life, there is a class of brahmanas to whom one should go for the prescribed atonement according to the sins one commits. Shukadev Goswami says that one has to execute the prescribed atonement according to the gravity of one's sinful life. He continues the example. Dosashaditva lagu or guru lagu Gavam yata bishak chetasa rujam nidanavit. When you consult a physician, he prescribes an inexpensive medicine or a costly medicine according to the gravity of the disease. If you simply have a headache, he may prescribe an aspirin, but if you have something very severe, he immediately prescribes a surgical operation that will cost a thousand dollars. Similarly, sinful life is a diseased condition, so one must follow the prescribed cure to become healthy. Acceptance of the chain of birth and death is the disease condition of the soul. The soul has no birth and death and no disease because it is spirit. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita 2.20, Najayate, the soul has no birth, and Mriyate, it has no death. Nitya sashvato yam purano nahanyate hani manisarede. The soul is eternal and everlasting. It is not lost with the dissolution of this body. Nahanyate hani mani sharide. Nahanyate means that it is not killed or destroyed even after the destruction of this body. The missing point of modern civilization is that there is no educational system to instruct people on what happens after death. Thus, we have the most defective education because without this knowledge of what happens after death, one dies like an animal. The animal does not know that he's going to have another body. He, does not, he has no such knowledge. Human life does not mean, is not meant for becoming an animal. One should not simply be interested in eating, sleeping, sex life, and defense. You may have a very nice arrangement for eating, or many nice buildings for sleeping, or a very good arrangement for sex life, or a very good defense force to protect you, but that doesn't mean that you are a human being. That type of civilization is animal life. Animals are also interested in eating, sleeping, and sex life, and according to their own methods, they defend also. Where, then, is the distinction between human life and animal life if you are simply engaged in these four principles of bodily nature? Distinction is made when the human being is inquisitive. Quote, why have I been put into this miserable condition? Is there any remedy for it? Is there any perpetual eternal life? 
I do not want to die. I want to live very happily and peacefully. Is there a chance of this? What is the method? What is that science? End quote. When these inquiries are there and steps are taken to answer these questions, that is human civilization. Otherwise, it is dogish civilization, animal civilization. Animals are satisfied if they can eat, sleep, have some sex life, and have some defense. Actually, there is no defense because no one can protect himself from the hands of cruel death. Hiranyakashipu, for instance, wanted to live forever, forever, so he underwent severe austerities. So-called scientists are now saying that we shall stop death by scientific methods. This is also another crazy utterance. That is not possible. You may make great advancement in scientific knowledge, but there is no scientific solution to these four problems, birth, death, old age, and disease. One who is intelligent will be eager to solve these four prime problems. No one wants to die, but there is no remedy. I have to die. Everyone is anxious to stop the increase of population by employing so many contraceptive methods. But still, birth is going on, so there is no stoppage of birth. You may invent many up-to-date medicines by scientific methods, but you cannot stop disease. It is not possible just to take a tablet to put it an end to disease. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is said that Janma Mriti Jira Vadi Dukha Doshano Darshana. One might think that he has solved all the problems of life, but where is the solution to these four problems? Birth, death, old age, and disease. That solution is Krishna consciousness. Krishna also says in the same book, Najanma karma tame devam vedvam yo veditatvada takta deham paranarjanma naitima mitisarjana. Bhagavad Gita 4.9. Every one of us is giving up our body at every moment. The last phase of giving up the, this body is called death. But Krishna says, quote, if anyone understands my appearance and disappearance and my activities, not superficially, but in truth, after giving up this body, he never again accepts a material body. End quote. What happens to such a person? Mam eti. He returns to Krishna. If you are going to Krishna, then you have to prepare your spiritual body. That is Krishna consciousness. If you keep yourself in Krishna consciousness, then gradually you prepare your next body, a spiritual body, which will carry you immediately to Krishna Loka, the abode of Krishna, and you will become happy. You will live there perpetually and blissfully. Protecting oneself from illusion. In 1973, Srila Prabhupada received an unusual letter from a woman in California, who had encountered two of his young disciples. She complained that they had a, quote, very negative outlook toward the people they meet, end quote. Moved by her genuine concern, Srila Prabhupada took time out from his busy schedule to write her this thoughtful letter. Your Grace, please accept this letter with love. Kmart, San Fernando. We have talked with two of your boys at different times. Both had a very negative outlook toward the people they meet. Do not believe that this in any way as it should be. These boys happen to represent God. This comes from within. Their outlook must have mercy. We realize this. Therefore, handpick these little pieces, sick of heaven, to place in the middle of these people, or else it will defeat your purpose. Love is. Let it be as it is. Love or not at all. Prayers be with you, and I beg yours with me. Yours in God, blessed be, Lynn Ludwig. My dear Lynn Ludwig, please accept my blessings. I beg to acknowledge receipt of your letter from California, and I have noted the contents carefully. Although due to extensive traveling and preaching in a tour in India, I have not had the opportunity to reply to you at length until now. Your complaint is that you have met two of my young disciples in California and they appeared to you to have, quote, a very negative outlook toward the people they meet, end quote. Of course, I do not know the case or what the, and what the circumstances are, but kindly forgive my beloved disciples for any unkindness and or indiscretion on their part, 
After all, to have to give up one's life completely for serving the Lord is not an easy thing, and Maya, or the illusory material energy, tries especially hard to again entrap those who have left her service to become devotees. Therefore, in order to withstand the attacks of Maya and to remain strong under all conditions of temptation, young or inexperienced devotees in the neophyte stage of devotional service will sometimes adopt an attitude against those things or persons which may possibly be harmful or threatening to their tender devotional creepers. They may even overindulge in such feelings just to protect themselves, and thus they will appear to be to some non-devotees or who are perhaps themselves very much enamored by the material energy of Maya to be negative or pessimistic. But the actual fact is that this material world is a miserable negative place, full of danger at every step. It is Dukalyama Shashratam, a temporary abode of death, birth, disease, and old age, a home of suffering and pain only. To come to the platform of understanding these things as there they are is not very common, and therefore persons at, who attain to it are described as, quote, great souls. Mama Petya Punarjan Mandu Kalayam Ashashatam Napnuvanti Mahatmana Samsidim Paramam Gata. This means that those who have understood that the material worlds are places of misery and temporality, Dukaliya Mashashratam, never return here again. And because they are Mahatmana, great souls, Krishna keeps them with him because they have qualified themselves to escape this nasty place by becoming his pure devotees. This verse is spoken by Krishna, God himself, in the Bhagavad Gita 8.15. Who can be a more final authority? The point is that to make advancement in spiritual life, one must view everything material with a pessimistic eye and unless it is utilized to serve and please Krishna. We are not very much hopeful for any lasting pleasure or satisfaction for our deepest cravings within this realm of gross matter. You refer to the word, quote, love, end quote, several times in your letter, but the actual fact is that there is no love in this material world. That is false propaganda. What they call love here is lust only, or desire for personal sense gratification. Kame Esha Krode Esha Rajaguna Samandava Mahasano Mahaprapma Vidi Anam Iha Vadinam. Krishna tells his Arjuna, his disciple, that, quote, it is lust only, which is the all-devouring sinful enemy of this world, end quote, Bhagavad Gita 337. In the Vedic language, there is no word for materialistic, quote, love, end quote, as we call it in the present day. The word kama describes lust or material desire, not love, but in the word that we find in the Vedas for actual love is parema, meaning one's love for God only. Outside of loving God, there is no possibility of loving. Rather, it is lusty desire only. Within this atmosphere of matter, the entire range of human activities, and not only in every activity of human being, but in all living entities, is based upon given impotence and thus polluted by sex desire, the attraction between male and female. For that sex life, the whole universe is spinning around and suffering. That is the harsh truth. So-called love here means that, quote, you gratify my senses, I'll gratify your senses, end quote. And as soon as that gratification stops, immediately there is divorce, separation, quarrel, and hatred. So many things are going under, on under this false conception of love. Actual love means love of God, Krishna. Everyone wants to repose his loving tendency in some object which in, is, in his opinion, worthy. But the question of is one of ignorance only because people have a poor fund of knowledge as to where to find that supreme lovable object who is actually worthy to accept and reciprocate their love. People simply do not know. There is no proper information. As soon as you have some attachment for anything material, it will kick you upon the face, deteriorate, and disappoint you. It is bound to dissatisfy and frustrate you. That's a fact. 
But these young boys in your country all and all over the world are accepting, quote, yes, that is a fact, end quote, and they are getting the right information from Krishna. Quote, after many births and deaths, he who is actually wise surrenders unto me, knowing me to be the cause of all causes and all that is. Such a great soul is very rare. End quote. Bhagavad Gita 719. Again, Krishna uses the word Mahatma, great soul. Therefore, our devotees that have met you are not ordinary boys and girls. No. They are to be considered actually wise, great souls, because they have been have experienced in many births the miserable disease of material life and have become disgusted. Therefore, they are seeking higher knowledge. They are seeking something better. And when they find Krishna and surrender to, unto him, they become Mahatmas, who is who are actually situated in knowledge. This work, material world is just like a prison house. It is a punishing place meant to bring us to that point of becoming disgusted, surrendering at last to Krishna and going back to our original nature of eternal life and bliss in complete knowledge. Therefore, it is to be to the credit of these devotees that what they have done is sadurlaba, very rare among all men in human society. By surrendering to Krishna, one will find the final object in which to invest his love. God. Love of God is present in everyone, just like a fire in an unlit match, but it is covered over. But if someone or other one develops his dormant love of God, and Krishna becomes his supreme adorable object, supreme friend, supreme master, supreme lover, then he shall never again become disappointed or unhappy, rather because his loving propensity is rightfully placed. Machitta madgada prana bodhayanta parashpamram katayanta shamam nityam tushyanti cha ramanti cha Bhagavad Gita 10.9 the devotee whose life is surrendered to Krishna is always enjoying, quote, great satisfaction and bliss, end quote. And he is constantly enlightened, always positive, not negative, as you say. The advanced devotee is the friend of everyone. The yoga yukto vishudatma, purified soul engaged in loving devotional service to Krishna, is sarva bhutatma bhutatma. Dear to everyone, and everyone is dear to him. In another place, Krishna says that Yo Madbhakta Same Priya, his devotee who is very dear to him, Advesta Sarbabhutana Maitra Kurana Evacha, is not envious, but is a kind friend to all living entities. The devotee is supposed to be, furthermore, equal to everyone. Pandit Samadarshana, he never discriminates saying, quote, this one is good and this one is bad, end quote. No. These are descriptions of the more advanced stages of Krishna consciousness that devotees get by development of mature knowledge. At present, many of our students are young boys. They are gradually learning and the process is so effective, certain, and authorized that if they stick to it, they will come to the right point, as you say, of loving but that love is not material, so it should not be judged on the false sentimental platform of ordinary mundane dealings. That is our point. Therefore, to say that they are not loving may be true from the materialistic point of view. They have given up affection for family, friends, life, country, race, and so on, which is all based on the bodily concept of life or flickering sense gratification. They have become a little detached from Maya's love or lust, and they want Krishna's love or endless, fully rewarding love, but they have not yet developed to that point, that's all. We cannot expect that all of a sudden your countrymen, who are addicted to so many bad habits, will give up eating flesh, taking intoxicants, having illicit sex life, and so many other nasty things, and overnight become self-realized, great self-realized souls. That is not possible. That is utopian. But just being initiated as Krishna's devotee puts one un, in the topmost category of human society. Sabudiman manusya sayukta kritsna kama krit. 
quote, he is intelligent in human society. He is in the transcendental position, although engaged in all sorts of activities, end quote. And although such a devotee may not have yet, yet advanced to the highest level of spiritual understanding, still, he is to be considered the most exalted personality, regardless of any temporary frailties. Apichet sudarachado bhajate mam ananyabak sadureva samantavya samyag vyavyashito hisa. Quote, even if a devotee commits the most abominable actions, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated. End quote. Bhagavad Gita 930. As you will say, quote, to err is human. End quote. Therefore, in the neophyte stage, we may always expect some discrepancies. Kindly see thing, the thing in this light and forgive their small mistakes. The big thing is that they have given everything, even their lives, to Krishna. And that is never a mistake. Your elder well-wisher, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. An Awareness of What is Best and Most Beautiful During May 1974, the noted Irish poet Desmond James Bernard O'Grady visited Srila Prabhupada at his quarters in Rome, and the two had a lengthy and lively discussion. Among other things, the spiritual leader and the poet discussed personal identity and individual duty, putting an end to war, modern education and its problems, life beyond time, and the essential nature of love. Mr. O'Grady, your edition of the Bhagavad Gita is very nice, Srila Prabhupada. It is the fifth edition in two years, Mr. O'Grady. In which country has the Hare Krishna movement been the most successful? Srila Prabhupada, everywhere. In Africa, America, Canada, Japan, China. But actually it has been most successful in America. Many Americans have taken to Krishna consciousness. Mr. O'Grady, what about here in Rome? Have you had problems with the police? Srila Prabhupada, we have problems everywhere. Police sometimes harass us. But usually they become tired and eventually don't do anything. Laughter. Mr. Grady. The system gave up? Give up? That's marvelous. I feel very tired of the system myself. Something is wrong with the present state of affairs. Maybe you can give me some advice on how to beat the system. Mr. Prabhupada. You Irish people. You're never tired of fighting. Mr. Grady. No. Laughter. It's inside us. Srila Prabhupada. Actually, the fighting has been going on constantly. Mr. O'Grady. Well, what do you suggest we do about it? I mean, is it morally correct for me to be sitting here? Srila Prabhupada. As long as we remain illusioned by the bodily conception of life, thinking that we are these bodies, one man thinking, quote, I am Irish, and quote, another thinking, quote, I am Italian, quote, American, and quote, Indian, and quote, and so on. As long as one, as this goes on, the fighting will go on. You cannot stop fighting between cats and dogs. Why do they fight? The dog simply thinks, quote, I am a big dog, and the cat thinks, quote, I am a big cat, end quote. In the same way, if we think, quote, I am an Irishman, end quote, or, quote, I am an Englishman, then we are no better than the cats and dogs. And as long as people remain in the bodily conception of life, there will be fighting. Mr. O'Grady, what was Mahatma Gandhi fighting in the House of Commons? Srila Prabhupada, that was another dogism. There is no difference. A dog thinks, quote, I'm a dog, end quote, because he has the body of a dog. If I am simply, if I am thinking that I am an Indian because this body was born on Indian soil, then how am I different from the dog? The bodily conception of life is is simply animalism. When we understand that we are not these bodies, but our spirit souls, then there will be peace. There cannot be peace, any peace otherwise. So, Gokra, the Vedic literatures state that a person in the bodily concept of life is exactly like a cow or an ass. People have to transcend this inferior conception of self. How is that done? Mamchio Samatityatan Bhama Bubaya Kulpate. 
quote, if one engages in the spiritual activities of unalloyed devotional service at once, transcends the modes of material nature and is elevated to the spiritual platform, end quote. Bhagavad Gita 1425. In our society, there are Mexicans, Canadians, Indians, Jews, and Muslims, but they no longer consider themselves Muslims, Christians, Jews, or whatever. They are all servants of Krishna. That is Brahman realization. Mr. O'Grady, that's giving it a name also, Srila Prabhupada. Yes, a name must be there, but although, for example, your name is different from that of another Irishman, you nonetheless all feel that you are Irish. One's name may be different, but that doesn't matter. The quality should be one. That is required. When we acquire Krishna's quality, then, despite different names, there will be peace. That is called Soham. The names of different people in a nation may be different, but all the people feel the same nationality. Varieties may exist, but if the quality is the same, that is oneness, Brahma Bhutta. Brahma Bhutta Prashanatmana Shokti Na Kankshati Sama Sarveshu Bhuteshu Mag Bhaktim Labate Param Quote, one who is thus transcendentally situated at once realizes the supreme, supreme Brahman. He never laments nor desires to have anything. He is equally disposed to every living entity. In that state, he attains pure devotional service unto me. End quote. Bhagavad Gita 1854. This world is miserable for the materially infected person, but for the devotee, the entire world is as good as Vaikuntha. For the impersonalist, achieving the Brahman stage, becoming one with the Absolute, is the last word. Mr. O'Grady, is the Absolute external or internal? Srila Prabhupada, there is no external or internal. The Absolute is without duality. Mr. O'Grady, okay, but in, in, on an individual level, Srila Prabhupada, we are not Absolute. When we are situated on the Absolute platform, we are Absolute. However, now we are in the relative world. The absolute truth is here also, but our senses are not sufficiently elevated to understand that absolute truth. As long as we are under the control of time, there is no question of becoming absolute. Mr. O'Grady, quote, so, quote, absolute life begins beyond time. Srila Prabhupada, that is stated in Bhagavad Gita 4.9. Janma karma cheme devim evim yavede tatpata tekta deham panar janma netimam sarjana. Quote, one who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not upon leaving the body take his birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal abode, O Arjuna, end quote. That is absolute, going back home, back to Godhead. As long as one is in the material world and identifies with this body, he transmigrates from one body to another. That is not absolute. This is clearly stated here. When one goes back to the spiritual world, he attains the absolute position. Mr. O'Grady, all right, but this is my question. It is, is it sufficient for us to sit here, you sitting here, there, and we as friends sitting with you, engaging in the gentle art of conversation, while across the ocean, Srila Prabhupada, the point you have missed is that although you are sitting as in one place and I'm sitting in a different place, this difference does not affect our actual existence. We are both human beings. The conceptions of quote, Irishman, Englishman, Protestant, Catholic, end quote, and so on, are but different dresses. One has to become free from these designations. When one is thus free, he becomes purified. Sarvapati bimirmuktam tatparat vena nirmalam rishikena rishikesha sevanam bhakti rushite. Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu 1112. When you have purified your senses and engaged these purified senses in the service of the master of the senses, Krishna, you have perfected your life. That is non-duality, and that is absolute, Mr. O'Grady. But the system insists that you think yourself American or Indian or African or whatever, Mr. Srila Prabhupada. Yes, materialistic society means duality, Mr. O'Grady. But that is unavoidable. How can you avoid material existence, Srila Prabhupada? That is possible in Krishna consciousness. A lotus lives in the water but never touches the water. Mr. O'Grady, I don't think you can explain situations in one area with metaphors from another. How can you argue political problems in terms of vague spiritual concepts? Their nature is completely different. So the problem. Sometimes a variety of example helps examples help us helps us to understand and appreciate the problem better. 
in the vase, there are varieties of flowers, and that variety helps us better appreciate the idea of flowers. From any point of view, Krishna can resolve all problems. Why just the problems of Irishmen or Englishmen? All problems. That is called unity and diversity. Our students come from different backgrounds, but because they are all in Krishna consciousness, they are unified. Mr. O'Grady, very good. Yes, I accept that. I would like to know, though, that when you say, quote, Krishna consciousness, end quote, is there any difference between that and Christ consciousness? Shadoprabha, no, there is no difference. Christ came to preach the message of God. If you actually become Christ conscious, you become Krishna conscious, Mr. O'Grady. And does becoming Krishna conscious or God conscious means mean to becoming self-conscious, that is, conscious of who we really are? Shiloh Prabhupada, yes, God consciousness includes self-consciousness, but self-consciousness is not necessarily God consciousness, Mr. O'Grady. But it may be, Shiloh Prabhupada, no, Mr. O'Grady. But one may achieve consciousness of the God that is within, Shiloh Prabhupada. That means he is God conscious. You are now in the sunlight, and consciousness of the sun includes your ability to see yourself. In the darkness, you cannot see yourself. At night, you can't even see your own hands or legs, but if you come before the sun, you see the sun and yourself also. Without sunlight, without God consciousness, self-consciousness is incomplete. However, God consciousness makes self-consciousness very clear. Mr. O'Grady, we meet a lot of young people in our teaching profession, and we don't try to teach them any kind of didactic salvation. We do try to direct them toward an awareness of what is best and what is most beautiful and what is most spiritually nourishing in the world about them. That is, insofar as the system allows us. Very frequently, the students are not neutral enough to be in a spiritual condition. They are more in an emotional one. What we are faced with is often is the basic question of, quote, who am I, end quote, or, quote, what's it all about, end quote. Shiloh Prabhupada, yes, Mr. O'Grady. They all ask, quote, why am I here, end quote. Shiloh Prabhupada, yes, very good, Mr. O'Grady. We are asked, why should I be here? Who are you, teacher, and what gives you the right to tell us what to think or what to be and what not to be? Why should I read Shakespeare, or why should I listen to Mozart, or prefer Bob Dylan? I prefer Bob Dylan, end quote. These kinds of questions seem to emanate from a very dis- delusioned state of mind and insecurity and uncertainty and the lack of credibility in the total structure of things as they are. Frequently, we have to answer these questions in a cataclysmic sort of way. Rather than presenting direct answers, we must answer directly, taking into account of the conditioning of the prompted students to ask these questions in the first place. Do you think that we should try to teach, reach them more directly? Should have probably. You're talking about the problem of, Mr. O'Grady, modern education, Srila Prabhupada. Yes. So many questions are there, but they're not answered by modern education. Quote, where have I come from? What is the purpose? End quote. These questions should be answered perfectly. Therefore, the Vedas enjoin, Tadvigyanartam Sagaruma Bibhagachet, to find answers to all these questions. One must approach a bona fide spiritual master. Mr. O'Grady, what if you have none? What if we are told that Mr. Nixon is the bona fide spiritual master? What do we do? <laughs> Shri Prabhupada, no, no, laughter. There is a standard for bona fide spiritual masters. You have heard, only heard one line of the verse. Who is the spiritual master? That is the next line, Shrotiyam Brahmanishtam. The word Shrotiyam refers to one who has heard from another bona fide source. The, a spiritual master is he who has taken the message from another qualified spiritual master. Just like, just, this is just like a medical man who has taken the knowledge from, of medical science from another medical man. Similarly, the bona fide spiritual master must come in the line of successive spiritual masters. The original spiritual master is God. Mr. Grady, yes, granted. Srila Prabhupada, one who has heard from God explains the same message to his disciples. If the disciple doesn't change the message, he's a bona fide spiritual master. That is our process. We, are, we take lessons by hearing from Krishna, God, and from, his under, from him understand who is perfect. Or we hear from his representative who doesn't contradict Krishna 
and who has realized his message. It is not that we speak one thing and do all nonsense. One who does so is not a spiritual master. Mr. O'Grady. Now there is my poor old father living west of Ireland. He is a simple, a simple old man, 78 years old, your generation. He has gotten to the point in his age where he says, quote, They tell me, the priests, they tell me ultimately that it's God who knows, but I want to know who told God, end quote. Then he comes to me and says, quote, You went to school and you read books. Tell me, who told God, end quote. So I have no answer. That's the difference between 78 and 39 years. So the Prabhupada, no, it's not a difference of age. The difference is knowledge. In the Brahma Sutra, the question is raised, quote, who is God? First of all, is this question. Mr. O'Grady, who taught God? So the Prabhupada, no. First of all, there is the question, who is God? Then we shall ask who taught God. The Vedanta Sutra said, Atado Brahma Jignasa. Now we should inquire who is God. Unless you know who God is, how can you raise the question of who instructed God? If you do not know God, the question does not arise who instructed God. Is this not so? Mr. O'Grady, yes. Sri Prabhupada. Who God is, is explained in the Brahma Sutta. Janmadhya Syayataha. Quote, God is he from whom everything emanates. That is God, the supreme being from whom everything emanates. Now, what is the nature of that supreme being? Is he a dead stone or a living entity? That is also explained. Janmadhyasya yato nidhyad itaras chadvesu abhignasarat. Srimad Bhagavatam 111. The supreme being is fully cognizant of everything indirectly and directly. He, unless he is fully cognizant of everything, he cannot be God. Then the question that you have raised comes, quote, who taught God? And that is also answered. Sarat, he is fully independent. He does not need to take lessons from anyone. That is God. If one needs to take lessons from others, he is not God. Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita, and he didn't have to learn it from anyone. I had to learn it from my spiritual master, but Krishna did not have to learn it from anyone. One who does not need to take lessons from others is God. Mr. O'Grady, where does human love come in? Srila Prabhupada, everything is coming from God. Being part and parcel of God, we manifest partial love because the original love is there in him. Nothing can exist if it is not in God. Therefore, love is there in God. Mr. O'Grady, and manifestations of love are manifestations of God? Srila Prabhupada, unless the loving propensity is there in God, how can we manifest it? A son is born of a particular father, has the symptoms of the father. Because the loving propensity is in God, we have the same propensity. Mr. Grady, maybe love is generated in you by the need. Srila Prabhupada, no. There is no question of, quote, maybe, end quote. We are defining God in absolute terms. Janmadhyasyayata. It is, God is he from whom everything has emanated. The fighting propensity is also there in God but his fighting and his loving are absolute. In the material world, we experience that fighting is just the opposite of loving, but in God, the fighting propensity and the loving propensity are one and the same. That is the meaning of absolute. We learn from the Vedic scriptures that when the so-called enemies of God are killed by God, they attain liberation. Mr. O'Grady, is it possible to arrive at this understanding of God alone? Srila Prabhupada, no. Therefore, we have cited this verse, Tadva Gyanartam Sagarum Eva Bhagachet. The word Eva Bhagachet means, quote, must, end quote. It is not possible alone. In Sanskrit grammar, this is called the Vidhilin form of a verb, and this form is used when there is no choice. The word Eva Bhagachet means that one must approach a guru. That is the Vedic version. Therefore, in the Bhagavad Gita, you will find that Arjuna was talking to Krishna, but when he saw that things were not being resolved, he surrendered himself to Krishna and accepted him as his guru. Karpanya dosho pahata svabhava prichamitam dharma samurachetā yat shreyasyan nichitam brihitan me shishyastehyam sadimam tam papanam Quote, now I am confused about my duty and have lost all composure because of weakness. 
In this condition, I am asking you to tell me clearly what is best for me. Now I'm your disciple, and a soul surrendered unto you. Please instruct me, end quote. Bhagavad Gita 2.7. So, here we can see that Arjuna has, is confused about his duty. Mr. O'Grady, is this duty to the self, to others, or to the state? Srila Prabhupada, a soldier's duty is to fight with the enemy. Arjuna was a soldier, and Krishna advised him, quote, The opposite party is your enemy, and you are a soldier. Why are you trying to be nonviolent? This is not good, end quote. Then Arjuna said, quote, Actually, I am confused. In this confusion, I cannot make the right decision. Therefore, I accept you as my spiritual master. Please give me the rough, proper lesson. End quote. In a chaotic condition, in a confused stage of state of life, one should approach another who is in full knowledge of the matter. You must go to a lawyer to solve legal problems, and you go to a physician to solve medical problems. Everyone in the material world is confused about spiritual identity. It is therefore our duty to approach a bona fide spiritual master who can give us real knowledge. Mr. O'Grady, I'm very confused, Shilo Prabhupada. So you must approach a spiritual master, Mr. O'Grady, and he makes a decision on how to help me stop this confusion? Shilo Prabhupada, yes, the spiritual master is one who can solve all confusion. If the spiritual master cannot save his disciple from confusion, he's not a spiritual master. That is the test. Samsara davanala lida loka tanana karana ganaganatmam praptasi karana ganadavasya vande garoshi charanata vindam. This whole confused world is just like a blazing forest fire. In the forest fire, all the animals are confused. They do not know where to go to save their lives. In the blazing fire of the material world, everyone is confused. How can that blazing fire be extinguished? It is not possible to utilize your man-made fire brigade, nor is it possible to simply pour buckets of water. The solution comes when rain from the clouds falls on the forest fire. Only then can the fire be extinguished. That ability is not in your hands, but is in the mercy of God. So, human society is in a confused state, and it cannot find a solution. The spiritual master is one who has received the mercy of God, so he can deliver the solution to the confused man. One who has the mercy, received the mercy of God can become a spiritual master to deliver that mercy to others. Mr. O'Grady, the problem is to find this spiritual master. That is not the problem. The problem is whether you are sincere. You have problems, but God is within your heart. God is not far away. If you are sincere, God sends you a spiritual master. Therefore, God is also called Chaitaguru, the spiritual master within the heart. God helps you from within and from without. Everything is thus directed in the Bhagavad Gita. This material body is like a machine, but within the heart is the soul, and with the soul is the super soul, Krishna, who gives directions. The Lord says, quote, you wanted to do this, now here's your chance, go and do it, end quote. If you're sincere, you say, quote, now, God, I want you, end quote. Then he will give you directions. Quote, yes, now you come and get me as like, like this, end quote. This is his kindness. However, if you want something else, that is all right, we can have it. God is very kind. If When we want something, he's in my heart directing me and telling me how to have it. So, why should he not give directions on how to have a spiritual master? First of all, we must, again, be eager to revive our God consciousness. Then God will give us a spiritual master. Mr. O'Grady, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada, thank you very much. My question to you is this. You are a poet. Just describe God. You are expert in describing, and therefore I ask you, to kindly describe God in your occupation, then your life will be successful. And if one hears you, his life will also be successful. That is the injunction. Idam hipumas tapasya shutayasrava, shutavsvitasya shuktasya chabudi datayo, avichuto rita kavibir nirupito, yad utama shloki gunaranabaranam. Srimad Bhagavatam 1522. 
There are many leaders in society who are poets, scientists, religionists, philosophers, politicians, and so on. Those who are expert, so expert, are given this injunction. Your duty is to perfect your occupation by describing the glories of the Supreme Being, Mr. O'Grady. My experience is that, for some extraordinary reason, one has chosen to do a particular thing. Srila Prabhupada, that reason is given here. Avichuta, the infallible choice, is this. Quote, let them describe the glories of the Lord, end quote. Mr. O'Grady, but you are saying that the spiritual master is chosen. The spiritual master, the poet, the priest is chosen by God. This person is chosen to write poems or paint pictures or make music, Srila Prabhupada. When, so when you compose music, compose music about God. That is your perfection, Mr. O'Grady. When one works for God in his line, then his line becomes his perfection? Srila Prabhupada, yes, Mr. O'Grady. Thank you very much.